How many people here actually come from Ubud? I can't see any <laughs> Of course, many of you come from Ubud. Right. How many people coming from Changu? Can you shout? Yeah. Woo! Yeah. Right. How many people here coming from Uluwatu? Oh, there's one. <laughs> no, okay, that's a lie. All right, so nobody's coming from Uluwatu. That's good. All right, so again. No, that's not good. No, 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 that's not good. Take my words. Sorry. <laughs> right, so again, welcome to Pecha Kucha Night Ubu 33, Indonesia All Stars. Many of you probably already know, but what is Pechakucha? So Pechakucha comes from a Japanese word. It means chit chat. Um, I talked about this with some of my friends. In Bahasa, it probably means chihuahua chibiwi. But, see, so, sorry, I can't, I can't really translate that, but it means, I don't know. In any case, um, or maybe mobro mobro. But um, as you know, um, it is called chit chat because the format is quick. Uh, but concise. So each speaker will have 20 seconds and 20 slides showing behind them. So 400 seconds or 6 minutes 40 seconds for each presenter to speak about their topic. So as you probably have guessed, the event comes from Japan. So the Hubu team, um, we brought the event, um, we took it from Japan and we brought it here to Hubu in September 2012 and so far we have organized 32 uh, Pekka Kuchas um, so it's been a long journey and it's always exciting um, and if you might ask what am I or nobody cares but anyways <laughs> my name is Vito, I'm Vito Persali and I am the city holder of Pekka Kucha Night Ubud and, ooh, and I am also the events manager of Ubud so, oh, I didn't expect people to yell on that part. Uh, so, with Hubud and Pecha Kucha, uh, we have welcomed many speakers on this stage. Um, we have had a child soldier before, a refugee, rapper, yoga teacher, because of course we're in Hubud. Um, all sorts of you know, professions, people who are passionate in what they do. And they come from many countries. Um, so one speaker came from Sudan. We have speakers that came also from North Korea. Uh, we have speakers from, of course, United States, European countries, Australia, New Zealand. But in many years that I've done Pecha Kucha, we always seem to find difficulties in getting you know, speakers. Um, and so tonight, uh, we have managed to scout it, collect it, gathered eight talented and inspiring Indonesian speakers from not only Bali but also from Yogyakarta and Yogyakarta as well. So please give a big round of applause. So as I said tonight is different. Uh, we have managed to get all these eight uh, amazing speakers. So they all they are all Indonesians who are who work on purposeful projects, uh, whether in uh, culture uh, sector or environment, hospitality, and many that you will hear tonight. And I'm very proud that our team is doing this, and also this month is our Independence Day as well. Uh, so I'm really proud that we're doing this one. <laughs> and uh, before we start, I would like to say, uh, please keep in mind that um, English is our second or sometimes third or fourth language um, for some who are talented. Uh, so, you know, there will be grammar mistakes during the presentation or also perhaps pronunciation, like mistakes in pronouncing the words, um, and including me as well. So, please be kind and in general, please be kind to one another. That's a message from Ellen DeGeneres. I love it. <laughs> right. So, again, before we start, I want to teach one rule. So instead of clapping tonight before the speaker come on stage, I would like you to yell as loud as possible. So I heard recently that if you yell, uh, it will give a positive energy, like it will pop their energy uh, for the presenters to come on stage and hopefully they will do it well. So can I practice now? Can I hear the yell? Woo!
Try one more time. Let's try that. Who's here excited to see the presentation of Abed and Luisa? Ariel? Ari Triono? Obviously, Ari brought a lot of fans. Dina? Fajar? Lily? And Putu Nurayati? So those are the eight speakers that we have tonight. I'm so excited to uh, hear the first speaker, speakers, because we have two speakers for the first vlog, Abid and Saka. They are ecopreneurs. They founded Niskala. It is a post-commercial post waste management service. So the idea was pitched during the UN Global Hackathon, Connect to Effect. Um, it, it was a couple of months ago in Hubert, and which brought them to the UN headquarters in New York City last May, where they pitched their waste solution to the world. Tonight, Abid and Saka will speak about why and how we too can keep Bali away from trash. Please help me to welcome Abid and Saka. And I'm Abid, a trans enthusiast from Gorontalo. This passion started way back because I used to live not so far from the landfill and I really remember how small it was. And breathing is the last thing that I want when I pass the place and it inspired me to do something. And today, I'm a Green School Recycling Center manager. So right now, I'm working on there and like I know the problem. So everyone come to Bali because of the last nature, but uh, once you got here, you will realize it's more than that. The island is so rich in culture and tradition. It is sacred, sincere, and timeless. Uh, so ceremony is very central in Balinese daily life. There are more than 3,000 ceremonies happening each year. And you can imagine the island was so busy with ceremony, right? But we're not doing this for money. We're not doing this for tourism. So we are doing this because of the philosophy, which is Trihitakarana. Trihitakarana is an ancient philosophy which literally translates into the harmony among God, into the three causes of well-being, which is a harmony among God, harmony between human, and harmony with nature. So Trihitakarana is well ingrained in almost every Balinese, Balinese life for generations. It's defined, it's play important part in defining the culture and tradition that manifests into ceremony. But sadly, we found a declining trend into the practice, practice of this philosophy. So, uh, we conduct a survey to a Balinese child between age 21 to 23, and 75% of them think that Tri Takarana wasn't fully applied in the ceremony. And almost all of them, 98%, felt this way because they don't feel the harmony with nature anymore. Why is that? That is regarding the post-ceremonial waste. So in a single ceremony, almost produce 100 kilogram of waste. And in fact, after a major ceremony, the number of waste that transferred into landfill will be increased up to 25%. So you have 100 kilogram every ceremony and 3,000 ceremony a year. That's a big number. And although there has been a few attempts to solve this problem, but most of Bali is still clueless in reg regarding how to treat the post ceremonial waste. Um, and then... <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> but the bottom line is, we found the problem is in a lack of understanding and also the lack of infrastructure to treat the post ceremonial waste. 
which is why we create Niskala. All right, so Niskala is a waste management service for the Balinese ceremony. That's why we create to solve the problem. Because you know, uh, Niskala is just like the unseen world. It's just like the waste problem in Bali. Something seems so far away from our side, but actually has really huge impact in our lives. We want to solve the problem, and our mission is to create zero waste ceremonies for the Balinese people by managing the waste properly. And here is how we work. The first, we want to install the separation bins and ceremony based on the categories of waste they produce. And then, there will be trash coordinator to assist the people in ceremony to put the trash on the right bin. And then, the waste we will deliver to recycling and composting station in Bali, so no landfill, no river, no ocean anymore. It's really cool, I guess. Yeah. But also, I like, we found this project, it's, it's free. We found this project, we have another project that aims to target a, a, a personal ceremony like wedding, which also usually generates a lot of waste. Can you imagine, like, wedding ceremonies, so many, many things in Bali, but like, they produce a lot of waste also. And also, because like, we make this special event to be, to be a gift for the earth. Also, you know, like, it takes time actually to achieve our goal because, like, all behavior, like dumping and burning waste is already rooted in our lives. But we, we, we really believe, we hope, through ceremonies, we can change that behavior because ceremony is, like, central of daily, of Bali's daily activities. And then, in back in March this year, we pitched the idea to the United Nations Global Hackathon Competition, and the end, you know what? After two days mentoring, we won as the first place to, re to representative in Indonesian region. And then, we pitched the idea again to again New York City and Geneva representative to win the Global Hackathon Competition. And you know what? We won, okay? and we engaged like a thousand participants from nine nations, and we stand up at the podium, podium of the United Nations headquarters in New York City. It's part of our journey, actually. All right, our focus right now is to make one temple to have zero waste ceremonies. Our target is temple in Denpasar, the one of the biggest temple in Denpasar. We want to make the temple as a role model because like the temples can reach many people. And also when we share this idea to the temple stakeholder, we receive so many positive response. They will support us to create the first maybe zero waste temple in Bali. <laughs> also, I target in the end of the year, we're gonna have four temples at least and we want to provide the zero waste wedding ceremonies for Balinese people, at least 50 ceremonies. Can you calculate, like, one ceremony produces 100 kilos, and five of them, four temples and 50 ceremonies, 50 wedding ceremonies, like, how many ways can we reduce to go to the landfill, to go to the river, to go to the ocean? And also, to develop your project, we, we want to bring trash new life. Maybe the trash already get bored to stuck in the landfill, on the ocean, even on the river. And like, this is the idea that we can make. It can be a roof. Can you imagine like the roof from the ceremonial waste, from the chana, also the paper, a natural dye from the, from the flower they use from the offerings. All right, to run this project, actually my mom a bit concerned about my future, how it looks like. Because you know, what I have to do with, with other people trust. It's not mine, it's not your business, bit. We just, it's like that. But you know, like, uh, I sent back, we sent back to our mom, mom, if not us, then who? If not now, then when? We have to take action. So in the end, life is a choice. Offer a problem and solution, we choose to be a solution. Now tell me, what's yours? Thank you so much. Wisaka, 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 sorry. Yeah, so well done, Abid and Wisaka. How do you feel after going first? I think I'm gonna go to the toilet right now. You wanna go to the toilet? Yeah. It is a film. It's very cool, man. <laughs> That's really great. Um, so proud to hear also your uh, journey as well. I think I Thank saw you. you before the UN Hackathon and then happened there as well. It's really great. Um, so maybe you can tell us briefly about the trip to New York. What did you get? What did you get there after the trip? What was what was the result? All right. Actually, uh, the event was held by Hubud, and they, they organized. Uh, we worked with the Connect Back and like controlled by the United Nations. And like at the time, we actually don't know that even what is 
how they even about. But like actually like it's about I, the first like we just think it's about seminar. But like when we when we attend the event, it's actually like a uh, like pitching mentoring session, and we pitch our idea uh, to to the first I mean to the to Balinese people that attend at the event. And you know like we make a team, and then like uh, suppose actually in Bali there are like more than twenty teams applied. And from that, we be the first winner to represent Indonesia. And then, we have to compete again with New York City and Geneva to find a solution for sustainable development goals number 12. And then, we won a game. <laughs> and then, like, uh, after that, we flew to the UN headquarters in New York City, and we met, like, many people around the world that, uh, I mean, like, the sustainable development activists. So uh, for me, the funniest thing for the trip to the United Nations was when we were pitching in front of the president of the United Nations, we started talking like this. And so we are from Bali and we want to make a zero waste ceremony and then he just stopped me there. And we were both afraid because uh, did, did we say something wrong or something? Because he just stopped us on the, like, in you know, that time. And then why he stopped us? Just because, oh, I've been to Bali like three months ago and I know there's a waste problem there. So. You can do whatever you want. I would totally support you. So it was just like, wow, you know Bali, a president of UN, and he know already, he already know the problem, and he support us. That was like making my day, right? Yeah. Makes our day. I think that's the funniest moment when the trip to the UN. That's great. Um, I'm gonna throw uh, to the audience now. If you, anyone has a question, yes. Is that Ika? Hi. Yeah. Hi. Ika. Um, hi, I'm hi. So there are many rituals in Bali as well. For wedding and uh, for other ceremonies, it's probably easier uh, to approach. But then there are other ceremonies like um, um, cremation and also manut. So how will you approach this? So uh, to be honest, not being negative or anything, but we have a big dream. We have, we want to make all of the ceremony in Bali to become a zero waste. But we realize it takes a small step at a time. So at first. What we really aim was, we want just to make sure that uh, everyone know you're supposed to be doing a ceremony because you want to be uh, blessed by the nature, not, not doing any impact to them. So at first it might be just to reducing the impact, maybe by reducing the using of plastic there, still keeping the organic and everything. And then after that, then we will move forward. So maybe we have to do some research regarding the impact of the ceremonial waste, even though it's organic or anything. But right now, I think I want to be focused just on the small step, just to make uh, Balinese people realize we should do something about this because it's supposed to be uh, blessing for nature, not impacting nature. Maybe it will be later than that. Yeah. Thank you. Anyone else has a question? You can applaud it. Oh, yeah. Hi, guys. Uh, so, first of all, you guys are awesome. Uh, Thank you. All right, thank you for the question. Um, I'll just reply for those who don't hear. So, during your new trip to New York, did you find, did you meet anyone that would be like your allies or like long term partner uh, for this project? Uh, the first, for sure, like the president of the UN. 
is we got the contact and like if we if we need help uh, from from him and he said also like I want to support you guys because like he already got the experience. The second one like we meet uh, like so many like environmentalists, like business people, the media people. So we connect to them and like they uh, we will email them and they email back and they support us to run the project. Especially like to, because like it's a. Uh, we want to make the service free, so we have to find like donors or donors. And we met like the Australian lady, and like she gave us like more than like a thousand Australian dollar to support the project to run like at least for temples in Bali. So like yeah, like everyone uh, really supportive, and we we really happy to have that support. Yeah. Thanks for your question. Thank you. Uh, one more question. Yes. Can you speak loud? How you doing? So at first we are targeting in one temple, and in a one temple, it's just like a free marketing because we do this our system there, and people just come go in there, and then they uh, they know us by the everything that we install, like they practice the separation and everything, and that will make them realize like, oh, you have there is this kind of program, there is this kind of service. I want to use this because. Almost like every Balinese person is struggling with the waste issue after their personal ceremony. And so we think why we are doing this at Temple, that's just like a free marketing and it's like education and also part of the marketing. Once they know about our uh, program and our service, they will, they will hire us and they will use our service. I think that's the, how we do that. Thank you. Cool. Uh, one last question before you leave the stage. Okay. Uh, how can people here help you? Besides funding, I'm sure you're looking for funding. Uh, are there any ways that we can help you with the project? Right. For people, maybe uh, we have like social media. We have like Facebook, Niskala uh, Bali. Uh, Facebook Niskala and Instagram Niskala underscore Bali. We will share like so many stories on that. Maybe the best thing that you can do like to share on Instagram. So like many people know about our, our our project and like will go support and go wider to around the world. Right. Okay, thank you, Abin and Misaka. Thank you. Sir. So that was just the beginning. The second speaker that we have on stage is a very young person. Well, in my uh, perspective. Uh, <laughs> sounds like I'm old, but I'm not. Um, so Ariel um, is 14 years old and is the founder of the gluten-free and handcrafted vegan buttercream bakery called Time and Paramel. Um, tonight, Ariel is hoping to inspire many young people to seek their life purpose. Uh, please give, give me a warm tone. Yeah? Please give a warm yell, because I said here to pause, to Ariel! you need to wholeheartedly love what you do. However, passion alone is not enough. There are other important ingredients to get into the mix to create a perfectly baked life of purpose. You see, kids my age, including me, are often lost in doubt or uncertainty on what we want to do in our lives. Sadly, more and more teenagers are getting depressed because of this. In Indonesia alone, more than 9 million people are depressed, and teenage group covers a big chunk of this number. If you ask a teenager about what we want to do when we grow up, a lot of us might say, I don't know, I haven't even thought about it. So I wanted my presentation to encourage young people so they can find their purpose and use their creativity to find their happiness. But let's start 
start by examining what passion is really about. According to the dictionary, this is the definition of passion. Pretty straightforward, right? It's something that sets your soul on fire. A likely source of what we are passionate about may come from what we were exposed to in our childhood. Simple things such as sketching, cooking, playing music, or action figures. To me, it's creating something with my hands, like crafting, molding, baking, and eating. But where does passion really come from? To add a bit of spice, I did a quick research on this and found out that it centers in our brain. A recent study published in the Journal of Neuroscience shows that there is a part of our brain that is activated when we do something that motivates us, the ventral shida. Let's call it VS. VS lightens up in proportion to how motivated we feel. The higher the degree of motivation, the higher the activation level of the VS. So that feeling of intense creativity or euphoria when we're engaged in something truly meaningful to us is real. And it's something physiological that happens within our brain. This means every single one of us can activate our passion. Think of it as a foundation for success. Now that we know how to ignite passion, how do we turn what we love to do into something that can make the world a little bit better? I started baking simply by the motivation of creating a healthier version of my favorite dessert. But then, I was soon to realize that I could do so much more than just bake for myself. I found my own way to promote a healthier, more responsible lifestyle through my cakes. Here, I found my mission. Last year, when I was 14, I started Famine Caramel, a vegan and gluten-free cakery using only real and unprocessed ingredients. The things that I can't put in my body, I won't put in my cakes for other people to eat. Last year, sorry, my cake helped to make people more aware about some of the simplest, yet largely ignored aspect in a more mindful life. Time and Caramel encourages people to be more conscious with what we consume. Things like knowing where our food is sourced from, what ingredients are in our food, or how it is produced. These are simple things that we, as citizens of Earth, need to start thinking. Now that we've looked up passion and mission into the mix, what else is missing in order for us to make a delicious life of purpose? I learned about this ancient Japanese philosophy of life called Ikigai from Mr. Google. Ikigai literally means the reason for being. It comes from two Japanese words. Iki means life and kai means impact or result. It's formed by four primary elements, what you love, passion, what the world needs, mission, what you're talented, vocation, and what, how you can get paid for, profession. Ikigai is the space in the center of these four elements. It's the source of value or what makes a person's life truly worthwhile. Vocation and profession. The last two ingredients that I've been able to make happen through time and caramel. It's where you can sustain yourself financially while doing something impactful with the things you're good at. My parents are my role model in this. They're entrepreneurs who are making an impact on healthy living, which has inspired me to do something similar. They've pushed me to get out of my comfort zone and provide me hands-on experiences by allowing me to work alongside their business. I spent lots of hours training and learning the business side of it by interning at my mom's restaurant. There, I helped to bake, take orders, manage clients, make an inventory, and so on and so on. These are all valuable learning experiences to me that has helped me gain the confidence in running Time and Caramel. Some side note that I think is important to share with you tonight is I decided to homeschool so I could manage my business. You see, sometimes, to find Ikigai, you need to take an alternative route of what's outside usually considered as normal. I'm glad that my parents have encouraged me to take an unconventional way of education, as they believe that education is a lifelong process and can be achieved by various paths beyond school. And to have my education as part of my profession is, to me, the most rewarding experience. I get to earn a bit of money whilst also learning. Today, I'm happy to say that I can pay for my own movie ticket. You may seem it's something very small, but hey, it is my achievement. Well, I was also able to pay for a recent buttercream workshop I did overseas with the money I made for my profession. Time and Caramel made knots of the world. Time and Caramel has allowed me to continuously grow 
improving my skills in baking and business. I love what I'm doing right now and I will definitely continue to grow. But I can happily say that I am already on the right track walking my path of happiness. And while time and caramel may not solve the world's largest issues like poverty or hunger, it has certainly helped me find my purpose in advocating for sustainability and happiness. And I do hope that this can inspire the young people, especially those who are fortunate enough to get to have an education, to feel empowered and inspired, to use their creativity into making something to make the world a little bit better. So to sum it up, yes, finding your passion is important. But we need to make sure that what we do can sustain our lives and help us grow. And to build a meaningful life, we also need to find a way how we can contribute to the betterment of our world. So to close it off, I'd like to say, jump out of your comfort zone and just do it. Be a star. Thank you. someone like you, or if I've heard a presentation from someone like you, I'll probably be different. I don't know. So I hope it changed a lot of lives here. And I see some kids here as well, so I hope they got inspired from you. Alright, so again, audience, anyone has questions? Yes. Um, hi, um, I really feel... Can you come closer, maybe? What do you want to do in the future? What has this opened up your mind? 
What is your plan for the future? A lot of things. I have a lot of things in my mind I want to do in the future. Right now, um, I'm running a boutique cake and I'd like to keep it that way. Um, I would love to grow and expand into, uh, I would love to travel the world and inspire more children. My aim is in younger children to inspire them to use their creativity in the right place so they could uh, give back to the world, give back to the community and make the world a better place. All right. Thank you, Ariel. Thank you. Hey, you're not going to ask me what I'm going to do in my two years. Or so. <laughs> I'm going to sleep tonight. Time. Right. Oops. Ariel. Next speaker, uh, who has a lot of fans tonight, is. Ari Triono. <laughs> Can't even hear my voice. Uh, my own voice. All right. Um, so Ari is the creative founder of Pasar Pasaran. Pasar Pasaran is a biannual artsy crafty market created and in Ubud and now around Bali and abroad. You will hear more about that. Um, Ari, um, right. So tonight. <laughs> Ari will speak about how we can make a big impact with small steps. Please help me to welcome Ari. Good evening, thank you for coming. This presentation is uh, dedicated to those who have small project or small business. Uh, that has been pending for a long time because maybe they think too much on how to be big. I would like to share a story about our project and how it was founded because of these three connected triggers. This is the first one. Do you know what it is? This is satellite. This is our big idea started here. So when we we're having uh, this yummy satellite while talking nonsense about um, creating something for locals, um, something creative, like something artsy and fun and with a touch with picnic event. So that's uh, our big idea start. Um, Pasar has become an inspiration for uh, when we create the name for our project. And the third trigger is I would like to introduce someone who gave us opportunity. She owns a cafe called Cafe Tropi. Who know me? So, one day, we met her and she asked, Hey guys, why don't you guys make an event here? And then we answered, okay. Three seconds later, we said, hey, oops, we said okay. Then we turned oops into opportunity. So that's why we launched Pasar Pasaran, a biannual RC crafty market in Bali. So for the, for the first time, the, the event is in uh, Cafe Topi in New Kuning. We collect and select um, indie craftspeople, indie handmade craftspeople or crafters. So our mission here is, first time is to inspire people. So um, yeah, about 150 visitors came, and about only 12 crafters joined. Yeah. So that was uh, that is the first time of Pasar Pasaran in Cafe Topi. And the next one, time flies, then we have the second, third, fifth, and until we make the most challenging one, the, uh, we were hijacking an abandoned gallery in uh, Sangigan. So this is like, yeah, in Sangigan, if you passing by the, the street, so we were hijacking the abandoned gallery, turned into a Narsi crafty market. Not only supporting um, local designers, but we also support activities or movements for a good cause. So we collect, we ask selected artists to exhibit their artworks and giving 50% of the profit for Orangutan Foundation. 
and we collaborate with Youth Palestine and Clean and Clean, Clean and Clean and Clean Movement to support their local environment movement. And last year, one of a fr friend of us uh, asked us, yeah, then, hey, do you want to open a shop? Yeah. Oops. We turn oops into opportunity. Okay. So to celebrate the opening, we create pasar pasaran G8, yeah, in Seminyak the first time. And it's not a big event. It's only showcasing 25 crafters, designers, to celebrate the opening of the shop. Yeah. We call our shop is a tiny showroom. It is a showroom, a showroom for um, handmade goods, local makers, and indie designers. And we have several activities, such as craft workshops and makers' tea party. Yeah. It is a gathering for makers. We think that Pasar Pasaran is not your usual event or market. Yeah. It's an independently run market has be that become a craft movement, a small movement to inspire and support small businesses and socio-printers. Yeah. Then we think that he will learn that even we're small, even though we're small, as long as we have idealism, yeah, like this, this is a social project for our next Pasar Pasaran from Jima. So we create braille necklace to support literacy for blind. This is what we call idealism. And the second one, yeah, consistency counts. With constant work comes constant inspiration. If you work regularly, if you work on something you enjoy, it will spark inspiration. Just play with it. And the third one, creativity. You need to be creative to survive. Like this. If you don't have galon, you will replace it with bottle. You have to be creative in daily life. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is what we call creativity. So, what's next? What are we going gonna do next for the next uh, Pasar Pasar? So it is September. Yeah, it is upcoming September on 17th, we will have Pasar Pasaran Kolaborasi in Garden, New Kuning. So, Kolaborasi is uh, the Indonesian word for collaboration. So, we challenge the artists, the designers, the crafters to collaborate with another crafters, another artist, organization to create a new project. Our mission is, our mission here is to explore to experiment more. Yeah. This is the upcoming Pasar Pasar. And for your information, before this one, last April, we went to Japan to create volume nine. So last April. And we think that even where we don't pick, yeah, being small doesn't mean that you have to think small. Then to close with the presentation, we think that idealism, consistency, and creativity can make a big impact without being big. Being small is not a sin, it's a choice, it's a statement. Thank you. I would like to call the team, Eta and Hanya on stage. <laughs> right, so, okay. awesome presentation. Um, has anyone here been to Pasar Pasara? Yeah. Yeah. Well, obviously, because you bring a whole lot of your fans here. So everybody. Uh, but please do come to the next one. It's going to be in September. In September. In September. 17. Yeah, and it's going to be at Sopa? In gar uh, at Garden. Garden. Jalan Yopuri. Jalan Yopuri. Yeah. Yes, uh, it's very great. Uh, they exhibit a lot of local crafters as well. And they do have music as well, right? Yeah. And, and we have like, uh, so we will have puppet theater also from Jogja. So they will have mini tent show um, at that event. Yeah. Yeah. 
and that, that event is normally uh, attended by a lot of Indonesians here who live in Ubud as well. Uh, so it's great to meet all the community here. Um, question. Anyone has a question? No? What? Sorry, yes. Uh, Hello, I'm Kata. Yeah, um, Kata. My question is, uh, it's like the previous question, what's your biggest challenge you face uh, with Pasa Pasara? I think that's Thank you. Um, we found that the biggest challenge were when we were creating the Pasa Pasara in an abandoned gallery. So it's a very old gallery. It's like so abandoned, so we have to renovate the roof, we have to clean up like a month before Gotong Royong with <laughs> friends. It's very like a challenge. And also the budget, because like we only have a small budget, but we want to create big impact with the small budget. That's the challenge, the most challenging one. That one. How many years has it been going? Um, it started in 2030. In February, yeah, it becomes a biennial RC crafty market. So, in September is, yeah, uh, for the it's volume ten. So the next will be next year. Uh, as we know, like Bali is a melting pot of people, and we have many craft girls coming to Bali. And, uh, how many like local craft girls are you? Uh, local Indonesian, Balinese. 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 How many locals uh, join this um, uh, event? I see Balinese. <laughs> <laughs> so, not only supporting the like urban pop crafters, but we support also the traditional artists. So, the first and the fourth pasar pasaran, we support local artist from Tanganan village. So he creates lontar painting. Lontar painting is very old manuscript. Like eight years that ago is uh, used by for uh, yeah, like Sanskrit. Yeah. So we support uh, the local artists. And also from, yeah, artists from Ubud designers. More or less. <laughs> 20, 30. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Um, one last question for me. Um, so you've, you've had these exhibitions, uh, you, you even brought it abroad, you have the store, you have all these products. What's, what's your next step? Next step. So, um, last April we went to Japan uh, to make Pasar Pasaran Follow Night. Then after that, yeah, we just socialize our movement from Instagram and Facebook. And suddenly, somebody from Korea, she she's interested, and yeah, she would like to invite us to grab Korea, or yeah, hopefully we can go there to make next pasar Thank you, Ari. Thank you. Basically, 
uh, it's organized by Hubud. Hubud is Bali's first co-working space. It was established uh, in 2013 uh, with uh, 25 members in the very first month. But after four years, 6,000 members from 80 plus countries already signed up with already signed up and work with us. And so, uh, I personally think that Hubud itself is more than just a co-working space. It's actually a place where a bunch of very vibrant people come together and constantly seeking to grow, to learn, and they seek to be productive and keep striving. And so, what we do to facilitate that, we decided to make events as our DNA. So that's why we decided to have 430 events per year, plus year itself. So if you do the count right, it's more than one event per day. Yes. Yeah. And so, uh, those events held around the topic of entrepreneurship, productivity, art, technology, etc, etc. So, I'd love to... Oh yeah, next story. I'd love to invite you all to our upcoming events. First of all, is Startup Weekend. And yes, that is Steve. He is hiding over there. Yeah, and then he's actually pointing to all of you to join Startup Weekend next in three months. And basically, if anyone uh, have no idea about Startup Weekend, basically Startup Weekend is a place, is an event where you can launch your startup in 54 hours. Is it possible? Am I drunk? No, I'm not drunk. And it is possible, yes, trust me. Uh, so basically, uh, in fact, we already uh, launched more than 30 startup ideas since four years ago. And so, if you have any startup ideas, or if you just want to join as designers, marketers, or anything, you can just join and save the date in 17 November 2017. And so, yes, this is very nice. And the next one is Women in Transition. So basically, who would really love personal growth? That's why Women in Transition exists. So basically, this program is a six-day, it's a six-day program designed especially for women. Will, uh, and we will help them to get through change. And then so basically what kind of change? Any kind of change, personal change, professional change, career change, anything. So this is the program to do that. And we just held one in Krakopola last week, and it was a huge success, so that's why we bring it to Bali, and we're going to do two batches. And uh, very soon one, it will be held in 10 to 16 September, so it will be like around two weeks, and the next one will be in so 12th to 18th November, and so, because it's designed especially for women, I'm sorry guys, um, so if you know any women who wants to get to the change and it helps, just contact us and we'll, we'll arrange anything for them. And so, last but not least, besides that, we really love celebration, really love it. Basically we celebrate everything, including failures, yes, that's true. And yes, fuck up nights. You hear it right, you read it right, I say it right, it's fuck up nights. So basically it's, a, it's an event where four speakers will share about their failures and they will also learn and will share the lesson that they took from their, from their failures. So it's, it's a very fun night and as well we also call this event fun as you end. So yeah. So the next one will be in Thursday, 21 September 2017. <laughs> And so, yeah, just save the date. And so, if you have any more inquiries or questions, you can just shoot us an email about events to events at hubu.org, or if you have any question about the program, you can go to team at hubu.org, or you can just follow us on social media. And as well, if you guys are curious about the space, if you, get, if you never have been to Hubu, we always do um, daily tour at 11 a.m. So, if you want to do that, you can just sign up in our website and yes that's it and that was quick i got my promise so yeah enjoy the show and i'll see you in the next event awesome thank you Ken Juan. Oh, i was expecting a dance <laughs> um yeah again about the events that you that Kita already spoke uh startup weekend for example or fuck up nice we would love to have or initiatives as well um, to join or to speak. Startup Weekend, we have the most international Startup Weekends probably in the world. Um, but we would love to see more locals as well to join and also to share their ideas as well, to, to be brave, to speak up and you know, like to pitch their ideas. So if you have maybe your 
you know, someone from your home stay or whatsoever, just um, push them to do it. Or you can also contact us, maybe we can help as well. Um, and yeah, and all the other events as well. So feel free to contact us. Um, right, our next speaker. Um, our next speaker, or our fourth speaker, is uh, Nadila Dina Chabrina, or Dina. So, yay! Don't worry guys, it's not over 9 o'clock, so you should be still doing it. Uh, anyways, <laughs> sorry. Dina has her bachelor degree in environmental engineering. Um, Dina is highly passionate about environment. So, currently working for Leaf Plus, uh, it is a communicative firm in Jakarta with an, an environmental approach. Uh, tonight, Dina will speak about the sustainable living journey in the urban areas and how to be more wise and conscious um, as a conscious human being on this planet. So, please give a green, warm welcome to Dina. enough to experience nature basically but back in my childhood I had changes to connect with nature quite often I realized I saw some family picture they brought me to beaches or even like Toba when I was a baby and the connections just made me happy and scientifically it is so it, it, it turns out my first attempt to help the world just like uh, when a uh, seven years old kid made an er energy efficiency at home, like turn off the light when you go outside, and mind your, mind your water when you brush your teeth and everything. And it continued when I was 13. I proposed to my principal in school to have an environmentalist group. So I heard reduce your recycle is one of the things. I'm a big fan of it after all. But instead, I started by encouraging other students to waste, uh, to responsible to their waste by putting in the right bin. And I also start to bring my own bottle and my own bag to reduce plastic waste at the time. I tried to find out why. I heard and read a lot about global warming and climate change. And exactly, it was the moment I found a reason of being. Over years, I continued and I decided to be an environmental engineer. And lately, I work as a sustainability analyst in one communication firm. But let's work. I created and implemented a sustainable event guideline, as in the waste management for events. So it's very really close to our daily activity. And on the other hand, I live in the in the in the city, but I really love beach and on the world life. That's why I concern on marine marine environment sustainability. I found in 2015, Indonesia claimed as the second largest polluter by plastics in oceans. And gratefully, I was chosen as Marine Conservation Ambassador at that time, and giving me access to projects as a solution. And basically, those plastics come from main islands like coastal area and Jakarta. We produce a lot, tons, thousands of waste. And where do those come from? Our lifestyle. As millennials, me and me include in the millennials, urban millennials. We have three million people there. In our lifestyle, if we can change, we can substitute, we can replace the plastics, we can really reduce that kind of issue. So basically, it's not really hard to, to do it. Just start with a simple thing. And I thought about this global movement. So I joined this global movement, Plastic Free Joint. Maybe any of you have heard about it. So I tried to share it in the social media, invited the others to do the same thing, this kind of movement, and then share the story. I started by, made an easy example. Like plastic bag. We can just change it to this. And the other thing, 
water bottle. We can bring our own bottle basically everywhere, so I encourage the other to do the same thing. We're not in tap water culture, but we can really ask at some restaurants or coffee shops. And here are the things. Delivery food with online transportation become a trend right now. And we can really choose to dine in or bring our lunch box. Also, with the cutleries, it's really unnecessary basically use a single one. So we can bring this uh, everywhere, but this is very small. The other thing is this little thing, plastic straw. Many times found in plastics or I already have ever, I have ever experienced like an intentional beach cleanup only 50 meters and I found those, those amount of plastic from plastic straw. So there's a thing. Another trend is quick serve coffee milk in Jakarta. It's really a trend there. And I asked one of the famous one, only one the famous one, they produce 1,500 plus per day. They open for six days. And like just like a big bag in London, if we stack after a week, they produce 9,000. So basically, I tried to analyze what happened in my plastic fragile line movement. I found in my case, I cannot really like free from plastic. I, I, I got seven days. And those come from food and healthcare, just because I was sick on that month. And Indonesia like to share. So that's the point. That's really okay if we want to start only how many days as we can. So those from my friends, they mentioned me and told this story publicly. I was really happy about that. They, they tried to do the plastic free lifestyle. And the other thing is, ha happily, I got 51 people engaged. I tried to analyze it. Some comments and some share their story publicly, or even some only told to me directly. And it was really makes me happy. So the main message is after Plastic Free July, we can really choose what we want, what we want to use, and being wise on our ways. Like years ago, I started by showing uh, beautiful pictures by nature before those kind of campaign. Just make, just make the others feel connected with nature, experience it by themselves, and then they want to protect it and change their lifestyle. So this year, I start to share my experiences and projects in my website, living sustainably and based in urban area, basically. And what I, what I want to say is. Telling, telling the story is powerful. We don't have to order. We don't have to. We don't have to ask them one by one, and they could inspire by it. So this far, I found this kind of formula: just make them connect, and then, and then, and then, when you want to start, we ha we have to start consistently, and then big positive changes won't happen overnight. So. Please start like not right now. Small step could be a big chance. Let's do it. Thank you. Thank you. Just like about 10 minutes ago, I was sitting there and I, I asked her like, hey, which one is your aqua bottle? And she's like, I don't use plastic bottles. <laughs> she's really implementing all these things that she's actually saying. Um, and um, yeah, and one more thing that you probably didn't mention. So you were one of the finalists of the Miss Indonesia Universe. Yes. <laughs> Ooh, all right. So you are representing this province in Indonesia. Gorontalo. Gorontalo. Oh. Yeah. Has any has anyone heard about Gorontalo before? Yeah. Please come. For those who don't, uh, maybe you can also tell a bit more about Gorontalo. Okay. So basically, I uh, was born and raised in Jakarta by both of my parents come from Gorontalo. And I have a big family or from Gorontalo, here, uh, there in Jakarta. And what I want to say about Gorontalo, they, it, it has a lot of beautiful nature spaces, like you can dive. So anyone lo lo loves to dive? If you're saying yeah. Bali, you can go to Gorontalo as well, because we have a uh, super nice underwater life. Also, we have great, great food. Do you like to taste the food? So we we eat we eat fish a lot, and like uh, corn soup with fishes as well. And 
So we have a lot of uh, nice food. So, uh, what more? <laughs> I well, think I'm, I'm pretty sure there are a lot of things in Gorontalo as well. Um, but do they know, like, where is Gorontalo? So Gorontalo... <laughs> can I... Hold on, maybe you should explain. So do they know? So I know, actually. In Celebes, you know? Do you know Celebes? Celebes or Sulawesi. So, Sulawesi, yeah. Yeah, so there's just one province in Celebes. Sulawesi is called Gorontalo. It's one of the youngest provinces there. Um, and there is a lot of nature resources there as well. Um, and not a lot of people visit, so it's quite hidden. So if you want to go there, you should check it out. Um, it's Gorontalo is the capital. Oh, yeah? Gorontalo, Gorontalo. Yeah, yeah. Gorontalo city. Right. Um, let's not talk about Gorontalo anymore. <laughs> not we shouldn't talk about it, but let's not talk about it now. Right, uh, other question? No? Oh, oh, yes. Uh, okay. As, as we know, for this uh, green lifestyle, uh, things like this is always like done by many people and many communities. Have you ever thought to like bring them all together and make like a big uh, thing together with other? by people, environmentalists, and other community to make the impact even bigger. Have you ever thought about bringing all the environmentalists and all these groups together so that the impact is bigger? I think that's the question. Yeah. yeah. So basically I start a small movement, as in lead them by example, as my daily lifestyle. I change it. So just showing them my lifestyle. In social media, we have a powerful effect, basically. So that kind of campaign, like a month, uh, trying to have a plastic-free lifestyle, also is one of the way. But uh, currently, I have a group of people. We come from communi communications, and then researchers, and then business persons. Uh, we gather some sustainable business, but really uh, like small, medium enterprises in Jakarta, in urban area, which is. Uh, people like really want to have this kind of lifestyle like me can have the those products. So we call it Project Semesta. We already done one uh, focus group discussion and talk about what the challenges to develop the sustainable product is in the supply chain or the resources. And our aim is to grow the market in urban area, to grow the lifestyle, having a really good lifestyle as in a green lifestyle. Also, we want to have uh, workshops and education series like to gain more knowledge as in business skills, also about the product itself. So we have this kind of platform now in Jakarta. It's still developing, just started like three months ago. Thank you. Uh, we have one more question from there. Yes? Can you become closer? Thank you. Are you the last to do Thank you. <laughs> so people in our age, especially in our best generation right now in Indonesia, you are one of the most, yeah, I can say, I can say Privilege with the internet, with the connection, with the social media, but we also have to um, keep in mind that we are the minority here. Uh, like so many people, you know, don't have access to even basic internet. So, um, during your um, during your campaign and research, have you found any insights on how to um, again approach those? less um, connected people of our generation. Thank you. Thank you, expecting this kind of question. <laughs> so, yeah. so with about the uh, uh, access, so the background of why I choose urban millennials in Jakarta first, just because I, I, I thought that they are all well educated. And they are all already with this kind of lifestyle. But the other people, like maybe they don't have any internet access, and they don't have any education level like ours. 
I think I cannot force them to do this kind of lifestyle because they're still thinking about what they want to eat today. So I choose the market first. So I make it the the this this well-educated market or a well-educated group bigger and have a, a, a greater voice. But I've ever talked to the fishermen in, if you know Anambas, it's really uh, close to Sumatra, but it's like a, our outer, out, the outer, how to say, outer, uh, what's called like the, the, how do you say it? The farthest, yeah, the farthest, the farthest yeah. island in Indonesia, and we approach them by they can have another uh, income, not only as a fisherman but also the tourism because tourism is growing now. But I, I, I suggest them to protect the environment as in the waste management, also how how they catch the fishes, just because. They, they, if, if they want still the income and and uh, sustaining their income, they have to protect the environment. I think that's all I can do, just because their education level and also their income level. So that's it. Thank you, Nina. What Dina just said as well, like, what I think is interesting about this topic is that most of us who live here in Bali, we've heard uh, probably like a lot of people, environmentalists, talk about this campaign of being green and stuff, and we are grateful for that, of course. But many of us are coming back home, and uh, we should sustain all this, you know, this green living. So hopefully, like you guys can also uh, apply all these things that we learn here, or all these things that we learn from the presentation back home, so that your city or your urban place can be more um, Right, so our next speaker. Right, so uh, our next speaker is Saptian Fajar. Right, so Fajar is a program manager of Project Child Indonesia. Uh, they provide alternative education for underprivileged kids in Yogyakarta. One of the programs that they run is the Internet Literacy Program. It is a program that educates children, parents, and teachers about safe and responsible internet usage. Tonight, he will speak about how we can create a safe online environment for young generation. Please help me to welcome Septian Fajar. Okay, so I will start my talk with a question. Please raise your hand if you ever illegally download something from the internet. Be honest. Yeah? You guys did? I did it too. Please uh, raise your hand if you guys are on Tinder or Grindr or KC or any other dating apps. No? You guys get it? We live in a digital era where internet has grown astronomically. By smartphone in our hand, laptop in our lap, we basically can access the world. From checking your ex status on Facebook, looking for your research resources, buying flight ticket to Bali, or just looking for summer fling on Tinder. <laughs> Unless you live in North Korea, it's easy for us to be connected. And we are privileged. We are privileged enough that we are born when internet is already uh, in a very good way. Uh, because we are smart and mature enough to process the content. But how about the post-millennials? How about the alpha generation, the digital native that was born when internet has already existed? <laughs> it is in Indonesia. From 256 million of Indonesian people, half of them are using the internet today. Even if our internet is sucks, I know. But 13.3 million of them are using the internet is the underage kids, more than the whole population of Belgium. They can access the same thing that can you access right now from porn site, gambling site, fake news, or everything in the internet. 
At a very young age, they are highly penetrated by the internet. But here in Indonesia, the digital literacy is very low. It's almost non-existent. This makes children remain one of the most vulnerable group of people to understand the risk and also the benefit of the internet. I talk with teachers from public schools in Yogyakarta. I met mothers who raised their kids in the riverbanks. What is their concern and their fear when the kids are close with the internet? They mentioned so many things. Uh, the most common one, uh, the most common answer is porn. They're always afraid with porn. And the other answer is uh, bad influence and being addicted with it. Uh, they very anxious until they forget that actually they are the one who provide the internet to the kids. They don't know how to educate the kids because it's also a new thing for them. Another question, do you guys remember when was the first time you guys watched porn? As I remember, I did it when I was 15. But kids this day watch since they are 6. It is not because they stole their parents' private collection like what I did. But they watch it from a smartphone. Like their very own smartphone from their parents. Even if they cannot afford for it, they can go to the internet cafe, which is very cheap. It costs just uh, less than one dollar for an hour. So, from this, we found a gap about how fast the expansion of technology with the very low digital literacy, there is a growing stigma. In fact, I believe that internet is very useful uh, for educational resources, both for the children and also the teachers. But the teachers decide to cut the internet connection with the children. In the school, they cut off the Wi-Fi. They cut all the internet connection because they're afraid. So I'm talking about internet literacy. What is internet literacy actually? What's the deal? It is not just the ability to access the internet, but also to understand, to critique, and be responsible on what you create, on what you're thinking online. But the most important thing is also encompasses about the social norms and the social values that are related with it. Uh, so, we came up with an idea how to solve the problem, how to fill the gap. When the teachers try to cut the connection, we try to juxtapose the problem with the subject, in this case the children. We partnered with Gameloft, a tech company from France, so together we create a computer lab in public schools in Yogyakarta. We connect them with Wi-Fi. Supported by 70 volunteers that work for us uh, for this movement right now, we run a weekly program. We teach them not how to safely remove your USB stick from the laptop, but it's more for the internet ethics, how to be responsible users, how to be a smart users. We already implement this program into three pilot schools in Yogyakarta, and this week in Yogyakarta, we run eight full active schools. And we realize kids these days are freaking smart. They are full of curiosity and they know how to fulfill it. And we cannot just try to repeatedly say to brainwash the kids, you don't watch porn, don't watch porn, don't watch porn. Isn't that work that way? We have to shift their curiosity to something that really funny to their daily life. For instance, how to solve a math problem, or how to uh, create a campaign from crowdfunding source to renovate their library. We also introduce them to coding, uh, the language of future, they say. Uh, we try to create a simple animation and a simple game. But moreover, what, uh, why we have to do this? Because we want to uh, tell them about uh, how to create a safe environment for themselves because they still don't aware that sometimes their identity being online could be dangerous for them. Maybe you don't realize it too, but you know, you have to create a safe environment. So we talk about the, uh, with them about their habit using the social media. And these pictures, we also invite the parents, we invite the teachers to uh, create several workshops to educate them about the current issues and preventive action. To again, together, uh, create a resilient internet users. That's the key, that's the collaboration between the teachers, between the parents, and us as the facilitators. Because we just spend just like two or three hours per week, but the teachers spend, and the parents, and even more the parents, spend their time longer with the kids. So, uh, what is our goal actually? Our goal is to raise the awareness that internet is not all about porn, it's not all about bad things. It's very useful education, powerful technology, and we want to keep the education value and useful. But economically, <coughs> Indonesia is very racing in, in the internet world, which is evolving rapidly, and we believe to uh, give these children a proper way to uh, learn the internet could be very beneficial for Indonesian future workforce, which is very uh, tied. But social-wise, why I do this? Because I believe that uh, porn are dangerous, I know, but racism and hate speech are even more dangerous. 
I really don't want to see the kids are uh, highly influenced by those racism content, by those hate speech that keeps spreading all over the Twitter, all over the Facebook, because we don't believe at the same God, because we don't have the same color skin. And then, if you realize it or not, it will generating a disrespectful generation. And I don't want to see my kids will be the uh, bad person in the future. Last but not least, in no small measure, why we are in the urge of internet literacy right now is because as cliche as it sounds, but children, they are the future of the, this, uh, the country, they are the leader, they are the future leader for this country and for this world. Sorry, not sorry, but I don't want to have a president who's talking about sexist, racist, and ranting and ranting all over in Twitter instead of working. Thank you. This program since March 2017. So, uh, if you're talking about the big impact, like we cannot still measure that because it's still new. But now, like the kids, uh, it's really um, enjoy the the class in, in our program, and they're always curious with something new. Like, uh, Kavajar, can we do this with the internet? And they always talk about, yeah, I know. Like uh, now, in my chat group in our class. <coughs> that kid never sh shares something bad again because uh, he already know that uh, it's not good for us. And uh, I'm really uh, overwhelmed with the um, uh, acceptance of, of from the parents because they, they also uh, encourage us to, yes, this is very important. And I know the world is like evolving very fast and we cannot, uh, you know, we cannot uh, hide that internet is really influence our kids. So, yeah, this program is really, uh, yeah, I can say it's very useful for the kids, especially in Jakarta because they are different. I mean, like, probably in, in, in the big cities like Jakarta or Bali, the kids are there and highly educated because the infrastructure is really great. But in Jakarta, even if in the city central, uh, the infrastructure is still like, inadequate enough for them to study, especially about the internet. So, yeah. That's the impact so far. Yes, please. Yeah, we also. Uh, was it as, uh, yeah. Is the idea to uh, share the curriculum to other schools, or is there supposed to be a like a lab? Like uh, we created a curriculum that's suitable for fifth uh, grader. And uh, we are talking about the internet ethics, about uh, you know how to create a safe environment and how to use internet in a proper way. Uh, and uh, it's very open to everyone. But we don't we don't really release it in our website. But if you want to know uh, about our curriculum, we're really open for that because we really want to be the platform that everyone can learn to how to educate the children with the internet. One How receptive has the education system in Jakarta been uh, to your program? How receptive is the um, education system in Jakarta uh, to your program? <laughs> Uh, well, the kids are really enjoy the class because they have another free time to play with the computers. But uh, the parents sometimes they still uh, deny that their kids are, I could say, like dangerous. I mean, uh, they always uh, several moms like uh, told me like, oh, I, I think my my kids are doing great. I mean, like uh, he's a good boy. Like my mom always thought I'm a good boy, but you know. Like, 
I don't know, like some some parents still deny that that their kids are prone with the bad influence from the internet. They always thought that my their kids are doing fine, so the challenge is still the parents. But for the kids, they love it. They love it because you know they have a free time to play the, the computers, so it's great. One last question. Yeah, I think we'll start from the closet, or we'll start from the closet. Ah. For the government, uh, not yet, they really support us, but not really support it, you know what I mean? But uh, from the schools, um, they are really open because we, I can say that we can, we give them a free computer lab, so they're really uh, happy with that. But uh, the key of the successful uh, of the program is the collaboration between the parents and also the teachers and so the stakeholder of the school. So, uh, the school plays an important role in, in, in this program as well. To keep supporting the children and encourage the other teachers because we only reach, uh, f but for now, we only reach the fifth grader, but we want to reach all of the uh, all of the students in the schools. So we, instead of give all the students, we uh, give the workshop to the teachers so the teachers can continue to their kids. Right. Thank you for <laughs> Yay. beers and coconuts and all the other drinks as well at the bar so you can grab it and also if you wonder what is this place so Itona uh, it's a gathering place so it serves great Asian food cuisine and it also has a bar so that's great and they hold performances here uh, staying from films to music to dance and discussion so you should take a look at their Facebook uh, and also because, because they hold regular movie screenings and uh, music performance, which I will be uh, a bit. Um, and Mitona has been uh, at Jakucha's um, venue since the second edition. So it has been 32 Pechakuchas. We've had 32, 32 Pechakuchas on um, this stage. So I would like you to also help me to thank Mitona uh, uh, for this awesome venue. So please give a big applause. about the event that I promised. So this Friday, no sorry, it's Friday, September 8th, they will have Mark Readout and the Rhythm. Uh, it is, they are the an uplifting and positive folk reggae funk act from Byron Bay, Australia. So they will be performing here. And also on Saturday, September 9th, um, there will be a psychedelic blues tour here on this stage as well. Um, it's a collaboration of seasoned and talented musicians from Bandung and Lombok. Uh, and they also have film programs on Tuesday, every Tuesday and Wednesday, so please make sure that you check the uh, Facebook. Um, and also there's another performance by Rizal uh, on 16th of September. So all of these are mentioned and posted on Facebook, so please uh, check there. <coughs> uh, right, uh, so the next speaker is Ang Ling Tilarsi or Lily. So uh, Lily is a green preserver. Uh, she's also the co-founder of Bun and Bunk, a cool hostel in Pantai Masketi in East Bali. So Bun and Bunk uh, collaborates with Balinese local farmers um, and their kids to help them provide a steady income, food, and also schooling. Tonight, Lily will speak about the efforts she put to preserve the green environment in Bali and help the local farmers around her neighborhood. So please give a big applause to Lily. Good evening, everybody. Um, before I go further, I would like to ask, is there any one of you that actually come to Bali to experience living with the local, right? And then experience uh, the culture and tradition, culture exchange and traditions, and the last not least is actually experience to help the locals to improve their well-being and see more green view. Who's with me? Yeah. So most of them. So I'm really uh, look what into uh, into it because I'm standing in the right place. So let me start it. Um, as you can see here, we often hear about less and less uh, 
agriculture and farming land in Bali, that farmer doesn't get a better life. This is funny how uh, we do not acknowledge people that um, helping us to provide our daily needs. Without people realizing it, Bali culture are uh, proud, uh, that we proud, it's actually a farmer's culture. Um, so more than 15 million tourists that visit Bali every year, uh, they more likely want to see uh, about Bali culture and tradition. Looking back again, the existence of various religious ceremonies and various types of traditional art, they are born from the culture of agriculture. So as you can see from the slides here, Bali is actually losing its identity. It's adding to the roots. According to Central Bureau Statistic of BPS, um, more than 750 hectares every year, nearly every year, is basically gone. Been taken by big massive resorts, hotels, and in 2016, uh, we only have about 80,000 hectares. If it's continued in the last 10 years, next 10 years, then more than 10,000 hectares will be gone. No more, a little bit or less uh, about green fuel. So the impact is very great uh, on the balance of the, the such as the increasingly widespread threat of flooding, uh, reduced water and air quality, and the ex uh, extinction of various types of flora and fauna. But the most important thing is our farmers, our ancestor, it's uh, going to extinct. And for example, in my area, the youngest farmer is actually 55 years old. As you can see from the pictures, right, my journey started three years ago. This is when I first time visited uh, Maschetti, when uh, me and my friends gonna go for a surf in that area. And then I've been approached by a local farmer and said, do you want to buy a land? And I was thinking, why do you want to sell your land in your own land? And the reason is only one, it's poverty. So during this time, they complain of getting expensive fertilizer, farming tools, the drop in community prices when harvest, and the difficulty of capital cannot provide a better food at the table and sending their kids back, back to school. So what we do is we begin to act as a bridge for them to contacting the right person, to give the right method of agricultural training, helping them to get the right contact and market to sell their product, in here and I connect to the right person which is the mayor of Gyanyar uh, to help us to start in this great project and um, encourage the farmers in this local community to be independent and become um, uh, more uh, confident about their project. Um, we also encourage them to become uh, their own investor so and helping them to provide convenience for farmers in production capital, post-harvest insurance, superior seeds, assistance, life insurance, or dependents of old age. So, uh, we believe, me and my friends basically, it not only comes, uh, Barnenbang will not only comes for a solution, but also a sanctuary for uh, to maintain the harmony between people, nature, and God. Like, uh, uh, maybe in earlier you hear, Trihitakarana, it's almost the same like that. So the we have three main concepts, which is the first one is to bring the concept further by implementing agro-tourism where visitors are able to stay, to learn and experience bar, uh, Balinese farming culture and tradition without sacrificing the land productivity. And we also collaborate with the locals to create a better steady income, like what Tito said before, to educate them with better farming methods and tools while inviting their kids to work part-time and sending them back to school. Uh, we also innovated and created conditions where everyone, young and old, um, is actually enjoy farming because growing your own food is actually awesome. Uh, at the end, we want to create a win-win solution uh, to, uh, to close the uh, generation gap that gradually grows wider in Balinese culture society. This is part of our project it's called Folunesia. Folunesia in here, um, we encourage uh, solo travelers or group travelers that basically most of it have a, a deep seek of uh, meaning of life where what I'm gonna do with my life like am I important so we basically to um, create a, a place for them to have an exchange culture to understand a simple life uh, and being part of uh, our home and Polynesia means in here it means that moment when you forget that you are voluntary to help change life because it's changing yours um, and then the next one is every six months, uh, we also have um, having a rotation of inviting teenagers from around the neighborhood to join us. The idea is uh, to give the local teenagers a chance to go back to school while working in part-time with us. 
So it's like we're empowering young generation, young people from the village to, uh, to learn, to work, and to live. And we also make connection between the school and the um, uh, world of work, enabling them to develop the knowledge and attitudes they need to succeed. As you can see, more than 10 kids since 2015, we have managed to send them back to school. And what is motivate us so far, because more than 100 teenagers in our area, in Madahar village, is actually not going to school because of the poverty. So we want to encourage more and more kids to actually have the potential uh, and uh, reduce the greater risk of social exclusion, uh, reduce well-being and uh, income in what? Sorry. Um, sorry. Uh, and uh, reduce well-being, income inequality, and reduce prospect. Okay. All right. So this is last but, uh, last but not least. Basically, the objective is ours is to in, importance of agriculture. Uh, is to create some more nature uh, preservation along with balanced farming heritage, making them more appreciative to environment and culture. And most of them, uh, most the most important thing is agrotourism for us is playing important roles in healing the gap uh, by involving youth generation in promoting traditional art and culture exhibitions like Balinese dance, painting and crafting. And we're hoping in the future that this uh, community again, once again, grow closer to agriculture, which is, is a Bali's true soul, restoring the prestige of being a farmer and ensuring Balinese heritage to last forever. So any one of you, if you want to come to Banen Bang, let's visit the local, support the local and love local. Thank you very much. Um, I just want to congratulate you because you just finished the marathon last yes. weekend. Uh, yes, on Sunday. And then being here as well, that's a lot of hard work. So, oh, um, are you are you going there with a mission? For the yes, basically. Um, Every time I, I run, um, it's, uh, I always raise a fund for the local, either a farmer or the kids, uh, raise awareness where I'm doing it for a cause. So make more and more people to be part of our group and to donate. And once I finish, you know, I get more bigger proposals, you know, like rather than in the middle of the race thinking like, oh, I'm doing, I'm keep running, it's so stupid. But I'm thinking like, if I finish, I can give more to the local community. I can make sure that in the future, these kids are able to reach their dreams. Does anyone have a question? Yes, please. Good question. How can I convince people not to sell their land? Because I know lots of investors coming from all over the world when they look at it and say, yeah, I'm gonna buy that land, money talks. Right. The first thing is, I will approach their family. Balinese, like it or not, even though they need money, they are much approachable people. When you come there and listen, you know, you try to give them solution and realizing that, pa, this is, if you sell it now, okay, you will have like uh, multiply, you know, hundreds, uh, millions of money, an instance. But can you manage it, you know? Can you, your kids manage it? Within six, seven, ten years, it will go on fast, quick, poof. You know, they like to spend, 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 spend. But we try to say, rather than you sell it, why don't you, why we can preserve this land, right? You can still work in your own land and in the future, it will be a heritage for your kids and you already have your own income, which is steady income. And then you can encourage your local as well, your friends to be co uh, collaborating with you. So we make more big, uh, bigger and stronger uh, to create more production, harvest. And then uh, maybe you can see from the slide before, um, you see the approach, one or two people uh, might think it's only one or two, but they actually, one of the people that have the biggest supermarket in El Pasar, which is Tierra de Wata, or online, uh, like Ubud Basket, that we actually ask them, can you help the, our locals, rather than to sell it to a local market and then get just cheap price for selling it, but they have a fair trade. So they just make sure that once they harvest it, post-harvest it, 
all the fresh ingredients will go straight away to the first supermarket in a town rather than just on the local and then get a cheap price. We basically acknowledge people and we make people realize that this is actually our farmer's product. This is organic. So we encourage them to become, what is called, yeah? um, confident, confidence about their own products. So this is how we educate them step by step. It's hard, especially I'm not Balinese. Maybe you're gonna see I'm not look like Balinese, but I'm not. I'm born and uh, and raised in Jakarta. So at the beginning, there's a cultural issues. First time when I come in and say, look, I'm gonna give you a solution. But they said, mm, you're probably gonna run away with another bully. <laughs> but I said, what makes you say that? Well, we try to approach people and give them trust. What when we give them trust, we gain their trust. And then, since then, it's been part of your family. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, one, of, one of the things you said that uh, you had your kids to, edu you know, to go to schools. Uh, once they're educated, how do you, you know, how do you think they react to kind of better prospects in other kind of industries or? You know, yeah, kids normally when they get go to, to, to get the proper education, as you say, yeah. send them to schools. You know, most probably they're gonna start thinking more about uh, other aspects of life. Maybe you know, and how do you connect them to their life? And then another one is, have you have you looked at other models in other countries where such initiatives have worked, or you maybe other other initiatives? Alright, so if I'm not mistaken, your question is how we, once we send the kids back to school, how we can convince them um, to actually uh, rather, because I know he said that the kids going to be oh, open mind, you know, open mind thinking. Uh, and then how we can encourage them to, yeah, to, to keep staying and then manage their own land, right? Yeah, so the thing is like this, when I approach their parents to work alongside with us, Right, to create agro-tourism. We invite the kids to run the hospitality. So by the time you come to Baren Bang, you're not gonna see Lily. You're gonna see the kids, you're gonna see the stars. They're gonna approach you. They're the one that we teach to actually uh, invite people to come and uh, exchange their culture, like Balinese dance and traditional and all. But I know, once they go to, <coughs> to school, right, but uh, they're gonna have a bigger point of view to travel. We're not gonna stop that, of course. You cannot stop kids from being broke. But we, we give them an uh, example by looking at their parents. So while they're working in the cafe or cleaning the room or talking with, the, with their parents, uh, sorry, with the guests, we try to approach them and say, look, your mom and your dad are actually working hard in the field. Why we, don't we go during your break time and helping them? So they can feel, they know, it's not a pressure for them. It's like fun activity. So, uh, and then they can encourage uh, the family members that come there and stay to encourage their skin and say, hey, let's go harvest some cassava. What's cassava? Is it grow in the, in the, in the, um, the tree or grow in the land? It's growing the land. How is it? So they're actually in, uh, creating their own way to communicate to people outside, right? But people like from outside as well, teaching them what's happening in the world because most of them, they never even travel far. They don't even know Sanur, they don't even know Ubud is actually bigger, right? They only know Ubud is a small area, they never travel until I show them pictures. This is Ubud now, and they say, oh, it's so big, it's like city center. So it's, it's changing, right? But uh, the second question is, sorry? Uh, have you seen any other models which work somewhere else? Any other models in other countries? Oh, yes. Uh, we, we, this is not the, my genuine idea. We basically go be fast and try to <laughs> diversificate to improve. The idea of creating, the first step is actually to clean the land first, you know, rather than to build up the, the, uh, the accommodation. We're basically fixing what's happening in the land field. First thing is they use too much. Uh, uh, chemical fertilizer. So we connect them with the right person, which is uh, people in in the government uh, department of uh, agriculture, right? To so approach them, to give them a right um, uh, a right tools, a right educate uh, to tell them what is 
should be used and should not be used. And then after, after the land is basically good, we start to build one by one. Example, for, uh, for some it's just the hostel. And the second one is a bungalow. And even in the bungalow, we don't put bungalow next to another. You know, we're still thinking uh, how we can preserve the land itself. You know, not to be close so tight like the one back in Changu. I'm sorry, I have to compare it with some, some area. But we put it every 1,000 meters square, only one bungalow. So the idea is the farmer itself still have to work in their own area to improve. And while they're waiting for uh, the plants to harvest, they still have a steady income from people that coming in. Yeah? Any other questions, please? I think that's the last question for now. Oh, okay, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. So it will be slightly longer than 20 seconds uh, per slide. We counted about seven minutes, so it's still okay. So our last speaker for tonight, please help me to welcome Ibu Putu Nurayati and Esa. Hello, semuanya. Selamat malam. Hello, all. Good night. Uh, good evening, everyone. Layang-layang, jika kita berbicara tentang layang-layang, apa yang Anda pikirkan tentang layang-layang? Apakah ada memori tersendiri tentang layang-layang tersebut? Kite. When you when we talk about kite, do you think of anything when you see kite or do you have some fond memories about kite? Everyone? Yeah. Yes. yes. Untuk kami orang Bali, layangan merupakan lebih dari sekedar permainan tradisional. Menurut kami, layangan memiliki badan, tulang, dan jiwa yang struktur dalam layang-layang tersebut. Dan kami percaya dengan adanya dewa layang-layang yang kami sebut dengan Daryango turun ke bumi seiring dengan adanya angin. Itu membuat para anak gembala atau petani bermain layang-layang di waktu yang senang. So for Balinese, kite more than just, is more than just a childhood game or more than just a thing. We believe that kite has body and bones and also spirit in itself and it's shown by the structure of the kite itself. And we also believe that we have this god of kite called Rare Amon, which we believe appears every rice paddy harvest time in the form of the wind. So the farmers and the kids can always have fun with the wind in the spare time in between. Dan kami suka sekali bermain layang-layang, itu sebabnya mengapa 39 tahun yang lalu diadakanlah festival layang-layang pertama kali di pulau ini. Namun itu tidak Mudah untuk berpartisipasi, terutama kami para perempuan khususnya. Balinese people really love flying a kite. That's why 39 years ago, we held our very first ever kite festival. And yeah, especially for women, it's been very hard for uh, participating in this. Di Bali, mengkombinasikan wanita dan layang-layang adalah ide yang tidak cukup baik. Karena wanita yang bermain layang-layang di Bali sering dicap negatif. Mereka sering menganggap kami sebagai perempuan nakal, perempuan tidak benar, ataupun tidak punya pekerjaan. Jadi, dalam adat Bali, perempuan biasanya hanya fokus pada upacara keagamaan ataupun pekerjaan rumah tangga. In Bali at that time, to combine the concept of women and kite was a good idea. Because um, Balinese women who love uh, playing kite often seen as the slutty girl or one of the jobless people or this easy woman. Especially at the time, uh, Balinese, in Balinese culture, women can, uh, can only have one concern, which is related to ceremonial things or household matters. Sekarang pertanyaan adalah, bagaimana saya bisa masuk ke dalam permainan yang didominasi oleh para laki-laki di Bali? Now the question is, how did I manage to get into this male-dominant game world in Bali? Sama saya ingat, waktu saya masih kecil, saya sering disuruh ibu untuk menjaga adik-adik laki-laki saya. 
Jadi biar mereka tidak nakal, saya sering mengajak mereka untuk menerbangkan layang-layang. Tapi saya tahu hal itu sulit untuk saya karena perempuan, tapi saya, dari sanalah timbul minat saya terhadap layang-layang. And now I remember years ago when I was a kid, my mother always told me to look after my brother. And one of the ways to tame my brother was by helping him flying a kite. And since then, I fell in love with kite and I was interested. And I, I, I was also fully aware of the fact that I'm a woman and that would be very difficult for me to join the festival. Namun saya tidak menyerah, saya masih tetap datang ke festival untuk mendukung banyak saya jika ada lomba layang-layang. Bersama perempuan-perempuan lainnya, saya menyiapkan makanan atau konsumsi untuk anak laki-laki. Dan dalam setiap festival itu, saya hanya bisa memandang dari kejauhan. But I didn't quit easily. So I found a way to start uh, to join the festival was by providing foods for the boys, which are the part of the banter I was living in. Uh, we provide foods with other girls, and after that, we just we would just watch it from afar. Dan sampai pada suatu hari, saya mendapatkan tawaran untuk menjadi komentator layang-layang. Di mana pada saat itu, untuk mencari komentator layang-layang perempuan di Bali sangatlah sulit, karena wanita di Bali umumnya kebanyakan takut hitam. <laughs> Lalu akhirnya saya mengiyakan tawaran tersebut karena saya menganggap wah wow, ini kesempatan yang luar biasa. So until this one day I, I was being offered uh, to be a kite commentator and it was kind of tricky at the moment uh, to find a woman to be a kite commentator because a lot of women were afraid to, of getting tanned to this skin reason and unlike them I, I saw this as one kind of opportunity so I said yes to it and becoming kite commentator after it. Dan pada saat sedang bertugas itulah saya sering melihat banyak wanita atau perempuan yang ada di lapangan tapi mereka hanya duduk, datang dan menonton. Dari situlah saya punya ide atau inspirasi bagaimana kalau saya membentuk satu grup layang-layang wanita di Bali. When I was in duty, I saw a lot of girls just sitting in the field watching from far and it inspired it inspired me how why don't I make this group kind of women? Dan seperti yang kalian sudah duga, hal itu tidaklah mudah. Alasan mereka itu tidak mau bermain lain-lain dengan kami adalah bangunlah alasan pertama adalah takut hitam, malu, gengsi ataupun lainnya. Jadi saya butuh waktu satu tahun untuk mengumpulkan hanya lima anak perempuan yang ikut bermain dalam layang-layang kami. Dan dari sanalah Sri Kani berdiri. And as you might all predict, it wasn't easy to form a group because a lot of women are afraid of getting tan because this beauty, Indonesian beauty standards, or and also because the prestige issues. And it took me one year to finally be able to gather only five women to join Sri Kandi. But yeah, since then Sri Kandi is existed. Dan saya masih ingat pergelaran kami tiga tahun yang lalu, grup layang-layang di Bali setelah 36. Kami merupakan wanita pertama yang ikut festival itu dan tentunya menjadi hal yang sangat kontroversial. Mereka menyoraki kita, menggodai kita, dan reaksinya sungguh negatif. Namun hal itu tidak membuat kami patah semangat, tidak kami patah harap, tapi kami tetap fokus dan bermain layang-layang. And I remember Sri Kandi's first appearance three years ago, and um, Sri Kandi was the first kite group of women that appears uh, since 30. Nine years, thirty-six years, sorry, I forgot. Thirty-six years ago, so it was very controversial, and people booed us, people kept called us, but we chose not to care about that and kept striving. Dan reaksi negatif juga tidak hanya datang dari lapangan, kami juga mendapatkan reaksi negatif dari media sosial. Kami sering mendapat pesan yang tidak senonoh dari para laki-laki yang mereka menganggap kami adalah wanita yang gampangan, karena wanita itu suka bermain layang-layang dan apa hal yang berbeda dari wanita lainnya. And the negative reaction was not only coming from the field, but also in social media. I got a lot of inappropriate messages from guys because they think that I'm this easy woman because I love playing guy. Namun untungnya, selain reaksi negatif, kami juga diliput oleh koran lokal yang memuat kami dari segi pandang positif. Dan keuntungan yang saya dapat dari publikasi tersebut adalah begitu banyak wanita-wanita yang mengontak saya yang tertarik dalam bermain layang-layang. Hal ini membuat tanggung kedua kami dalam berlomba tidak sulit karena sudah banyak wanita yang berpartisipasi. But despite all the negative reactions that's coming in social media and the field, thank God we got a lot. We got covered by one of the big local newspaper with a very positive angle. And from that publication, Sri Kandi got a lot contacted by women who turns out uh, interested in playing kite. And it made our second year easier because more women participated.
Dan di tahun ketiga ini kami Sri Kani tidak hanya terdiri dari lima orang tapi sekarang terdiri dari 22 orang anak perempuan. And now it's our third year. Sri Kani is no longer consists of five women but 22 women instead. Sepuluh tahun saya menekuni bidang komentator layang-layang dan baru di tahun ketujuh saya berhasil membentuk satu tim layang-layang yang kita panggil komunitas pelayang pecinta wanita tradisional layang-layang tradisional dan di balik perjalanan ini saya memiliki misi lebih dari sekedar menerbangkan layang-layang. It's been ten years since I have become a kite commentator. Um, and it took me seven years to finally be able to form this kind of group of women named Sri Kandi uh, as this uh, first traditional group uh, of women. And behind all this journey, I got my own mission. Yang pertama tentang emansipasi wanita. Saya ingin membuktikan bahwa wanita bisa melakukan apa yang pria lakukan dan kami tidak tidak lebih baik ataupun tidak lebih buruk dari mereka. Firstly, is about the first, um, women's emancipation because I believe that women can do what men can do, and we can be good at that. Dan yang kedua, saya ingin mengubah pandangan masyarakat terhadap wanita yang memiliki hobi yang berbeda dari wanita lainnya. Pada umumnya, bahwa tidak ada salahnya apabila kita memiliki hal yang berbeda dari mereka. And secondly, I want to change the stereotypes towards women who have uncommon hobby from women in general. So basically, that is wrong when you think like, uh, when you like different things. Dan yang ketiga, dengan layang-layang saya ingin mengingatkan masyarakat tentang pandangan masyarakat yang sudah lama terlupakan, yaitu wanita Bali terkenal akan kekuatannya. Yeah. And lastly, with Kai. I want to remind again, I want to remind the society anymore, one more time, um, about this image of Balinese women that is long forgotten that Balinese women are well known for their power and for their strength. Thank you, Bu. Um, I think I said so. I was just speaking English, and you will translate it to Bahasa to you, right? Okay. Um, just want to make sure. Anyways, no, I just want to say you have a really lovely voice. You have a radio voice. So, <laughs> hold on, I'm like, wow. <laughs> no wonder they ask you to be a commentator. Right. Terima kasih. You're welcome. Right. Uh, <laughs> right? Sorry. <laughs> okay, so you will share. All right. Um, does anyone have a question here? <coughs> One? Yeah. <laughs> if, if if any girl here, Balinese girls here, want to join, how? Kalau mau ikut, gampang sekali caranya. Yang pertama memang hobi. Jadi bukan bergaya-gayaan aja nanti, tapi kita bisa ada ada follow di Instagram, ada di FB kami. So, um, the girls can join the Sri Kandi. Uh, firstly, the most important thing is that playing kite is your hobby. And you can also find Sri Kandi on Instagram, it's everywhere basically. Other question? Other question? Yes. Is there, is there anything else that she does that is not traditionally Balinese? Is that your question? No, that breaks the barrier. That, that breaks the barrier? It's being translated, guys. <laughs> Baiklah, saya mencoba mengerti uh, tentang tradisional layang-layang Bali. Uh, kami... Mungkin uh, pertanyaannya ada, ada apa hal lain yang ibu lakukan yang mungkin... Um, apa ya? Mematakan Mematakan Bali nya ya Umumnya di Bali 39 tahun yang lalu Tidak ada wanita yang bermain layang-layang 
kecuali kami. Jadi hal itu yang mempatahkan bahwa norma-norma di masyarakat bahwa wanita itu tabu dulu, sekarang kami melabrak hal itu men, e, untuk emansipasi wanita, kenapa tidak wanita sekarang ikut berpartisipasi? <laughs> so, 39 years ago, uh, women who play sky, it was really like a type of thing. So, do you think that it's, uh, Srikandi was like one of the things that is pretty embarrassed though, because they uh, they're like the first group of women who play sky. I think that's, that's the answer, answer to your question. <laughs> Kalau hal lain serena yang layang di grup kami, kami juga bisa menari Bali, kami bisa menyanyi dalam bahasa Bali, tapi semua tentang tradisional Bali. Jadi semuanya itu layang-layang yang punya fokusnya yang mana? Besides this kind of things, um, they they also can uh, Bali is can do Bali is dance and also Bali is you know song something like that. So basically everything is like traditional though. Yeah. But the activities they mainly yeah. focus on uh, kites. Yeah, because like flying kites on the yeah. Any other questions? questions? Yeah. Um, so number one is, does she still receive negative reactions? And number two would be, and you have to forgive me, this might be like a sort of Western ignorance. I don't understand the connection between kites and um, the negative portrayal of women. Saat ini reaksi negatif itu sudah tidak ada sejak ada International Kite Festival. Jadi International Kite Festival itulah yang membawa kami nama Bali dikenal oleh orang. Jadi mereka sudah tahu oh ternyata di Bali sekarang sudah ada wanita yang bermain layang-layang. So the negative reaction is no longer exists because because There are uh, there is this international kite festival, and actually it turns out that Balinese uh, kite women players are really famous and yeah outside the country. So that that means it's no longer be bullied or something like that. Yeah, and the second. Hubungannya mengapa di Bali bermain layang-layang didominasi oleh laki-laki? Karena pertama layang-layang dianggap permainan tradisional oleh laki-laki. Kalau di Bali zaman dulu kala kan laki-lakinya pakai kamen, wanita pakai kamennya itu ayu. Jadi kami tidak mungkin berlari dengan layang-layang dengan pakai kamen. Jadi kami ayu. Lalu seiring waktu kami berganti kami dengan tenaga yang cukup kuat kita menerbangkan layang. Karena di Bali layang-layang itu bukan kecil. Tapi lima enam meter ke atas. Kalau layang-layang di International Kite Festival paling layangannya satu meter dua meter. Tapi layangan orang-orang di Bali itu besar karena kami banyak yang menarikan. That's long answer though. I will try my best. So long time ago, kite players using this tarung, so it would be hard for women to you know run and fly a kite. So that's why for women it's not. Was that impossible? Was it possible to do this? And also because. <laughs> so basically, like for in the culture, like back in the old days, you know, like I think it's quite common as well in the Western world that men are normally well, it's like they outside and stuff, and then kite, especially these kites in Bali are quite big. So it's normally like you need power and stuff, and it's not very feminine as well, and especially what you mentioned about the clothing, like. For the guys, they wear clothing, but it is more uh, flexible, so they can run. But for women, they have to look, you know, like a bit. Um, yes. 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 Yeah. Shut down. That's the size of the guy. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
four meters or or bigger, maybe when they made it also uh, by themselves, right? Right. Any question? Okay, last one. Pernah ada ini nggak bu media internasional yang ngecover dan gimana reaksi? Apakah ada reaksi internasional yang pernah diliput? Did you have so kita apa sih? Oh ya, so did you have any media international media that covered you and your group? Waktu tahun lalu ada International Red Festival di Sanur, jadi ada beberapa pelayang dari Singapura, Jerman, 18 negara. Jadi mereka yang meliput kami dengan mengubah kami mungkin di media sosial dari sanalah kami dikenal. Yes, there was this international media covered Sri Kandi because there was this kite festival in Sanur and a lot of groups from other countries, from Germany and from other countries uh, also participated in that, so that's why we got covered by the international news. I think that's all. Well, thank you, Ibu. <laughs> so that was the last speakers uh, for tonight. So uh, eight, these eight speakers will be outside as well in the courtyard. There will be music, so you can chat with them and you can also have drinks uh, and talk to all these people here. Uh, and again, thank you so much for coming tonight. The next Pesca Kuncha will be in October. Uh, it will be in um, line with uh, Umut Writers and Readers Festival. Again, thank you and see you next time. Bye.